I would like to take this opportunity to wish you a blessed and happy Easter and pray that God will shower you and your families with every blessing. What I told the newly baptized, those received into the church, those who had been there for confirmation, all of whom were confirmed just a few hours ago at the Easter Vigil, I am going to tell you this Easter morning. And I, as your pastor, want you to always remember it. Make it a point of reference as an anchor for your soul, your life, amidst the treacherous currents of this present world. Christianity, especially Catholic Christianity, is under attack. People of Christian faith are portrayed by the popular media as the enemy of mankind, living in gross intellectual darkness, enslaved to their atrophied minds. Consequently, if you are a Christian, especially a Catholic, you are at the very least a curiosity, sometimes pitied, always suspect. Faith, the very act of faith, is portrayed as irrational, as contrary to fact, an act which denies reality, a kind of escapism for the weak-minded, those who live in a dream world of fantasy because they can't face things as they really are. Although this may be true of some forms of faith, some religions, and some people, it is certainly untrue regarding the faith of the apostles and the Catholic religion. Allow me to tell you why. The fact of the matter is that the Gospels make clear that the apostles were inclined not to have faith and were very slow to believe. In this respect, they were nothing like the caricature of the popular media and more like the skeptic of our own time. In Luke's Gospel, for instance, when the apostles were told that Christ had risen, the Gospel informs us, and this is a, is a quite literal translation of the Greek, but these words seem like pure nonsense to them, and they did not believe them. In Mark's Gospel, we are told point blank they did not believe. So how were the apostles moved from their skepticism to belief, to faith? That's the real question. The truth of the matter is that it was their encounter with reality, with the facts, such as the linen wrappings and the face cloth in the empty tomb and the empty tomb itself, which caused them to begin to be skeptical about their own skepticism. And ultimately, it was the actual appearance of Jesus Christ after his resurrection and his interaction with them over, on several occasions over a period of 40 days, which became the foundation of the apostles' eyewitness faith and subsequent eyewitness accounts, which we have in the Gospels. That is the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And by resurrection, I do not mean, as the popular media so often suggests, some kind of mere soul survival, but the definite, datable, empirical fact of the actual bodily rising of Jesus of Nazareth from the dead, an actual encounter with the man they had lived with and known for three years, the man they had seen crucified and laid stone cold dead in a tomb, that same Jesus, standing before them victorious over death, sin, Satan, and the grave, vindicated as the one he had always claimed to be and who he truly is, the only begotten Son of God. This was the objective, immovable fact which constituted the basis and cause under God's providence and grace of the faith of the apostles. In other words, 
And this is an important point because it is so often misconstrued by the media. It is not and was not the apostles' faith, their naive credulousness, that somehow created or invented the event in their minds. Nor was it their minds which interpreted, spun, as it were, the facts in such a way that made faith possible. It was the actual bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave and their actual encounter and relationship with him after he had risen that elicited by God's grace their subjective faith in him as the objective resurrected Christ. Who from that day on, as history has demonstrated, could not and cannot be dismissed or ignored, even though he could be and can be denied. As it was in the days of the apostles, so it is in our day. For instance, the very act of denial by the new atheists and their accomplices, our benighted media, turns out to be ironically an implicit affirmation of the fact that Jesus is not dead. And he is not dead because, as the apostles have testified, he is risen. He lives. This Easter Sunday, we celebrate the central, overwhelming fact of human history and the cosmos. That is, whether we want to believe it or not, the truth of the bodily resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. That's why we're here. But all this being said, what is the meaning, the significance of it for you and for me? The resurrection makes evident the divine acceptance of the sacrifice offered by Christ on the altar of the cross for the sins of the world, your sins and mine, and even those of the new atheists. And therefore, the resurrection makes evident and is the guarantee to those who believe that God, the true and living God, accepts the sacrifice made present by our Lord on this and every Catholic altar for the remission and forgiveness of their sins until the end of time. And it is by that that heaven is won or lost. Since that first Easter Sunday, Christ's one holy Catholic and apostolic church is where the faithful gather, irrespective of time or place, to encounter and worship the true and living God, the God who has revealed himself, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit by means of the acceptable sacrifice of Jesus Christ upon the cross of Calvary, who rose on the third day. Here in this place, at this time, the reality of his resurrected body is recognized by those of us who believe, by the angels who, though unseen, join us in adoration, and the powers of darkness, Satan and all his defeated hordes who tremble before our Lord's holy presence. For here, in point of fact, the body and blood, soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ are made present in the blessed sacrament of the altar. And there is more real power in this than in all the enemies of Christ and his church. There is more power in this than all the darkness, all the evil that the godless world can muster. There is more to this than we can imagine this is no mere childish, naive fantasy, no mere thoughtless retreat from reality. The facts that flow from that first Easter Sunday when Jesus Christ rose from the dead are irrefutable. The Jewish authorities, in alliance with pagan Rome, denied them and pitted themselves against these facts and were thereby dashed against the immovable rock upon which Christ builds his church and against which the gates of hell cannot and will not prevail, let alone the, let alone the new atheist, atheistic materialism, secularism, and radical militant Islam in all of its malignant forms, which have each 
and together declared war against Jesus Christ and his apostolic church. They're the, the latest in a long train who have done so. Given the facts and the testimony of history, who do you think is going to prevail? In truth, it is they, and all like them, not the Catholic faith, which is the enemy of mankind. It is they, not the man or woman of genuine Catholic faith, who is enslaved and living in darkness, gross darkness, intellectual darkness. And it is, in truth, they and those of their ilk, not the person of Christian Catholic faith, who is to be pitied. The very act of defying and denying Jesus Christ is irrational, contrary to fact, and a denial of reality. To do so is to suppress the truth and unrighteousness. It is the consummate act of folly. It is truly an instance of wishful thinking. It is not, however, that Christ and his church are not being opposed. They are, and often viciously and violently, as recent events have made manifest. And in this regard, we may very well be witnessing in our time, to quote the Catechism, the final unleashing of evil. We may indeed have begun that time, again quoting the Catechism, when, before Christ's second coming, the Church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers, a time of persecution that will unveil the mystery of iniquity in the form of a religious deception, offering all of humanity an apparent solution to its problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. <clears throat> but if we are, if we are presently in that time, and if we have entered such an era, know this, at the end of it, which will be the day of judgment, again quoting the Catechism, Christ will come again in glory to achieve the definitive triumph of good over evil. And on that day, again, as the Catechism teaches us, the kingdom of God will come in its fullness, and the righteous will reign forever with Christ, glorified in body and soul. Therefore, don't be a fool, and don't be deceived by fools, however articulate they may appear to be. Do not be intimidated by the powers of this passing world, religious or secular, however formidable they may seem to be. Make Jesus, the risen Lord, and his one holy Catholic and apostolic church, and the holy sacrifice of the Mass, the center of your lives, and the foundation upon which you build your faith, your family, and your future. This and this alone, to quote an often misused phrase, is to be on the right side of history. For although for a time, for the time being, Jesus Christ may be defied and denied, he is not dead. Therefore, we Catholics, those of us newly baptized and newly confirmed with the gifts of the Holy Spirit and those of us who have been Catholic for many Easter's, with our feet firmly planted on the ground, rooted in, not running from reality, with our eyes firmly fixed on Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, anticipating his second coming, proclaim with great joy, Surexit Dominus Vere, truly Christ is risen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.